Hey, good morning. <laughs> good morning, all. As you are... you're making uh, making way to your seat we appreciate uh, all of the uh, folks that are here in attendance this morning and so welcome uh, to the to the Nicholasville Church of Christ we're glad that you are here um, for those that are visiting with us on behalf of the entire congregation welcome you and, and uh, hope that you'll be back hopefully you uh, may be in the seat back in front of you you may see a connection card and so if you wouldn't mind just fill that out for us so we have a record uh, of your attendance, and we'll be able to uh, hopefully reach out uh, to you later. Uh, but it is a wonderful Lord's Day, a beautiful day outside, of course, and it's a, a lot going on here today. And so uh, we, you may have seen on your, on your way in, we have a few, I guess I'll say exhibits, uh, uh, some, some things that our youth has done uh, for the Last to Leaders program, and I know Ernie uh, spends a tremendous amount of time sort of directing that traffic and we're thankful for him and thankful for those uh, kids that participate in that but I, I want you to think about that and encourage these kids encourage our youth to continue to do those types of things and let us also be encouraged by their efforts um, that can mean a lot for us too so I want to really focus on uh, on that element uh, today also it's uh it's that time of year, um, back to school. And so, yeah, a lot of parents are really happy that it's back to school, right? I'm not, I'm not one of those. Uh, but uh, a lot of parents are really excited. Their kids are going back to school, and that's a big change for some of these kids. And so uh, we're thankful for, for that, another, another year that, that, that we've uh, progressed. And so um, – after services, we'll have a, a potluck uh, dinner downstairs. All folks are welcome. If you have kids in school or not, you're still welcome to, to come down and, and, uh, and fellowship with us and, and uh, uh, be part of that meal. And related to that as well, at the end of our service today, we'll have a special prayer uh, that I think uh, our elders, uh, Bob and Chris, will lead a special prayer over... Uh, those kids, uh, over the kids that are headed back to school and the youth, uh, as well as those parents. So at the end of service, uh, we'll, we'll ask, and I, I think uh, maybe lead during announcements, we'll, we'll probably ask those kids and parents, if you want, to come forward uh, so that the elders can pray uh, for you and with you. I think I've covered about everything in our announcements this morning. Um, may, may have forgotten something, but again, glad you're here. Uh, there's a lot of things that we could be doing, right? The world uh, uh, presents a lot of distractions for us, a lot of other places we may uh, want to be or need to be, and a lot of other things that we could go do. But I'm glad that you've made the decision to be here and worship um, our God and, and Savior. So with that said, I think Elijah is going to... Uh, read a scripture for us, and then that'll be followed by uh, Jason Grow leading us in song. And so again, uh, welcome you here, and let's turn our hearts and minds uh, toward our worship of uh, Jesus Christ. Elijah. Good morning. Today I'll be reading out of 1 Chronicles chapter 29. I'll be reading verses 10 through 13. Therefore David, ble Therefore David blessed the Lord before all the assembly, and David said, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and give strength to all. Now, therefore, our God, we, we thank you and praise your glorious name. Good morning. 
First song we'll sing this morning is Lord We Come Before Thee Now, number 419. <clears throat> Lord, we come before Thee now, at Thy feet we humbly bow. Oh, do not our suit disdain, shall we seek Thee, Lord, in vain, shall we Sunday morning. So thankful to be here in this church and to have a, a peaceful place to come and worship you. We realize, dear Lord, how blessed we are to live here in this community where we don't have to worry about uh, a lot of externalities. While we have various problems, they are probably very you know, small compared to what many people deal with around the world. And we, we give thanks, dear Lord, that you've given us that uh, peace and tranquility to worship here. We ask you to continue to bless our elders and the deacons as they do their best to make the best decisions possible to uh, grow your church community and to um, spread the love of Jesus Christ throughout here. And we know that that's a very difficult test, uh, task for them and we ask that you to continue to keep uh, helping them uh, guide us along the way. We also ask you to uh, a blessing on leaders further out in the community and around the country and help, uh, 
help them to see, uh, be less d divisive between uh, various uh, ideas. We know, dear Lord, that uh, many of us have different ideas, but help us to agree on what's most important, and that's, that's you and following you. We ask that you uh, uh, look over the children as they start the back to school and the lads to leaders um, kick off. We know how important it is for children to be exposed to that earlier in their lives so they can continue on with those lessons throughout their lives to be future leaders here and in the community. Once again, dear Lord, we're just thankful to be here this morning, and we pray that uh, we uh, treat one another as we would ask them to treat ourselves, and that we worship you in spirit and in truth. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our next song before we leave the lesson, uh, number 220, He Lives. <clears throat> I serve a risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. In just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blast. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Please be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I've been, my throat has been especially dry this morning, so I, I brought this up here, and if I have to pause halfway through, uh, please uh, forgive me for that, but uh, really great to see you all, great to worship God together. Uh, like Jason was saying, we have some special things planned for after service as well, uh, so it's a wonderful day to be with God's people. Speaking of God's people, uh, we began a new phase of our theme uh, for the year, starting last week. And we're calling this series Belonging to Christ. Uh, and this is a series focused on the church. Uh, this is a series focused on all of us as the church and who God calls us to be. And as we really get going into that this morning, into that series, I hope we can keep the title of this series at the forefront uh, of our minds as we explore what it looks like to live faithfully as the church today. Uh, Jesus is at the center of the church. Jesus is the heartbeat of the church. We talked about that last week. He's the head of the church, the foundation of the church, and we belong to him. We've given ourselves to him individually, and we've also given ourselves to him uh, collectively. And what I'd like to do this morning is lay some foundation for giving ourselves to him uh, in this way, again, both as individuals and as the church. When we're talking about what it means to be the church today, we can easily jump right into what we should be doing and what steps we need to take uh, to be the church today. And if we're going to let God's word inform what we should be doing, we're probably going to turn right to the New Testament. After all, we want to be the New Testament church, so it makes sense that we would turn there. And we will as this series goes along. But if we really want to understand uh, the church and what it means to live as the church, 
we first have to look at what comes before the church and who comes before the church. Again, it can be really easy to ask, all right, what do we need to do to be the New Testament church? But we first need to ask, what has God done that the church needs to recognize and understand and fully embrace as true? And again, it can also be easy to just jump right to the New Testament to ask what the New Testament church should be. But God himself doesn't actually begin just with the New Testament to talk about the church. He gives the church roots in what he has done long before the church came into existence. And so, again, if we want to live as the church today, we need to understand the church. And if we want to understand the church, we have to first understand what God has done long before the church came to be. And that's what we're going to be doing this morning. There's a whole lot that could be said about that topic, that, that concern. Uh, and so it's a lot more than I can cover uh, in just one brief sermon, but I would like us today to consider three things uh, that God has done for the church that we need to see and understand and internalize, three things we need to praise God for if we are going to faithfully live as the church today. First, understanding the church un means understanding what it means to live in a covenant relationship with God. God is a God of covenants. This is how he connects to people. This is how he relates uh, with his people, enters into relationships with them. It's through covenants. And this can be hard for us to appreciate today and hard for us to see the importance of because the only real covenant relationship uh, that most people recognize today is the covenant of marriage. And even marriage is viewed by a lot of people as just a piece of paper, unfortunately. Not as something sacred or holy, but it's just just a quick arrangement, and we'll see you know, how it works out. Uh, but a covenant is a binding relationship between two people on the basis of promises or sworn oaths. This is how God connects to, this is how God relates with his people throughout Scripture. Now, sometimes God enters into covenants with specific individuals. So, for example, God made a covenant with Abram, whom he would go on to rename Abraham. And with that covenant was the promise that God would make a nation from Abraham, that nation would have its own land, and God told Abraham that all nations would be blessed through him and the nation that would come from his children. Our summer series this year has been on King David, a man after God's own heart, Scripture calls him. And God made a covenant with David, uh, telling him that his ancestral line and his throne would last forever. So sometimes we see in Scripture God entering into covenants with certain individuals. But other times, God enters into covenants with entire people groups. And in the Old Testament, God made a covenant with his chosen people, the descendants of Abraham, called Israel. And we won't explore that covenant uh, in any depth or detail this morning, but if we did do that, uh, we would see how that covenant involved God providing uh, for Israel, uh, protecting their land, giving them prosperity, while they were supposed to respond by following God's commandments and worshiping him alone. That's God's covenant with Israel. And really the rest of the Old Testament shows us how mightily Israel struggled to uphold its end of the covenant and how often they failed at that. But this is how God relates to his people. He does this through covenants. And while all these covenants are going on in the Old Testament, the Old Testament also takes time to look ahead to a new covenant that is coming one day in the future. These are the words of the prophet Jeremiah. He says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And then, when we come to the New Testament, we see that God relates to us as his people the same way. The church is in a binding covenant relationship with God. So read with me what Jesus says when he serves the first Lord's Supper. This is a great uh, moment where this is drawn out in scripture. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks for it, uh, he gave it to them saying, drink of it all of you. 
For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. The author of Hebrews, he says that Christ mediates a better covenant with us than God's covenant with Israel. And he will actually go on, I don't have it on the screen here, but he will go on in the, in the next verse uh, to read from Jeremiah. He quotes Jeremiah, that same passage we just read a moment ago, about that new covenant. And Jesus also fulfilled God's covenants with those two individuals we mentioned earlier. God's covenant with Abraham and with David. So again, God had promised Abraham that all nations would be blessed by his descendants. And Jesus is a descendant of Abraham. And all nations can be blessed by entering into a relationship with God through Jesus. And in the same way, God promised David that his descendants and his throne would last forever. Well, Jesus is a descendant from David, and he reigns forever as king at the right hand of God. So God has fulfilled both of those covenants in Jesus as well. And so it is a covenant that connects the church to God. Now notice something with me about each of these covenants. God is the one who initiates all of them. God is the one who initiates all of them. People do not approach God in Scripture and try to persuade him to enter into a covenant relationship with them. God is always the one who makes the first move. God is always the one offering the covenant. God is always the one offering the relationship. Now, why would God do that? Why would he keep on offering to enter into relationships? Well, people only offer to enter into relationships when they want to enter into relationships. So God, as a God of covenants, shows us that he wants us. He wants a relationship with us. And sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we can slip into thinking that God, instead of wanting a relationship with us, that God at best maybe tolerates us, uh, and that he's actually very easily annoyed at us. And if we want to be on his good side, we really have to work hard to earn it, to stay on the good side. And one little mistake could just end the whole thing. But God reaching out to us for a covenant relationship, secured by the blood of his own son, should tell us something about how much he wants us. And therefore, how much he must love us and care for us. And so understanding covenants is very important for understanding what it means to be the church. Understanding the church also means understanding what it means for God to be king over his kingdom. This is something else that can be kind of hard for us to relate to because we don't live in a kingdom. Uh, We often say that we live in a democracy. Uh, Really, technically, we live in a republic, but either way, it's not a kingdom. Uh, And and so it's important for us to appreciate God is not a president. God is not a prime minister. He's not some other elected official, uh, you know, elected by the people or elected by representatives of the people. And he doesn't have a term limit and those kinds of things. He is the king with all the majesty and all the sovereignty, all the long lasting authority that goes along with ruling as a king. And God rules as a king, not just over a limited kingdom, like an earthly kingdom that has borders, that runs up against some other uh, kingdom. God rules as absolute king over the entire universe. King David says these words uh, as he prays to God near the end of his life about this very thing from 1 Chronicles. He says, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom. O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. So God rules as king over the whole universe, but it's not just over the physical universe. It's not just over nature that he rules. He actually rules over all nations. He rules over all people groups on the earth. So this is from Psalm 22.8. It says, For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. So God is king over everyone. God is king over everything. But that's actually not all there is to God ruling as a king. God also rules as king in an even more focused way, in an even more direct sense over his chosen people, which again, in the Old Testament, is the nation of Israel. So hear with me the words of the prophet Isaiah uh, speaking for God. He says, I am the Lord, your holy one, the creator of Israel, your king. Also, the last judge of Israel, Samuel, he told Israel when they began demanding an earthly king, a human king, 
and that would go on to create a whole lot of problems for them. But he told them that they didn't need a human king because God was their king. And so we see in Scripture that God rules over the universe, he rules over all nations, and specifically he rules over his people. So that's a pretty thorough reign. Uh, that, that's very thorough, but even still, even though that's the case, like with the New Covenant, the Old Testament prophets look forward to a time when God will reign in an even more complete way. So here again with me, the words of Isaiah, and then we'll move on to the prophet Zechariah. Isaiah says, then in that time, the moon will be confounded and the sun ashamed for the Lord of hosts reigns on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and his glory will be before his elders. And then in Zechariah, on that day, living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea, half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter and the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. Well, once again, when we turn to the New Testament, we see this same focus on God as king. The gospel accounts sum up Jesus' message uh, of the gospel as a call to repent for the kingdom of God, Jesus says, is at hand. Jesus, when he says that, is telling his fellow Jews that the hopes of the Old Testament are now on the brink of fulfillment. The Apostle Paul, he says that God has delivered us as Christians from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. John begins Revelation by praising Jesus for loving us and freeing us from our sins by his blood, and then he says, and making us a kingdom. So in the New Testament, as in the Old, God remains king not only over the universe, not only over the nations, but specifically his people the church. And one day, when sin and evil and Satan are fully defeated, God will then reign in the most complete sense. The book of Revelation ends, and really the whole Bible ends, with the voice of God coming from the throne, right, where he reigns as king, the voice of God coming from the throne, declaring that now at last the dwelling place of God is with man. It's with humanity. They will be his people, and he will be their God. So God reigning as king tells us something very important about him, and that is that he is in complete control. Now that is not to say that he is the only one who's active in this world. Satan is active, the world is still fallen and broken by sin, and people can live against God's will, and they can hurt themselves, and they can hurt others in the process, but God works even through the brokenness and evil of this world to accomplish his will. And if you've been part of our Sunday morning class in the book of Acts, you've been seeing some of that develop in the text of Acts. But God works through even the brokenness and evil of this world to accomplish his will. And his final victory over all sin and evil, it is definitely going to happen. It's not a maybe, it's not a contest, it is going to happen. He is king and we are his subjects, we are citizens of his kingdom, and our king is in complete control. Last of all for this morning, understanding the church means understanding, uh, well, it, we have to understand what it means to call Jesus the Christ. This is, again, something we sometimes take for granted. Uh, we can sometimes, because we, we refer to Jesus as the Christ so much, we speak of him as Jesus Christ, we can slip into thinking that Christ is Jesus' last name. And so his full name, uh, first and last, is Jesus Christ. But the word for Christ is Greek for Messiah. And the word Messiah means anointed one. And so when we say Jesus Christ, we're actually saying Jesus the anointed one. Well, what does that mean? Well, in the Old Testament... Priests were anointed by having olive oil poured on their heads. Uh, this was a, a, a visible thing that marked them out as chosen servants of God. Israel's kings were also anointed with oil the same way. And by the time we get to Jesus, many Jews were speaking about a specific Messiah, a specific anointed one who would fulfill the hopes and the prophecies of their scriptures and sit on King David's throne and restore Israel to the power and the glory that they had in the past back when people like David, Solomon were king. Well, then in the New Testament, Jesus comes to earth and is announced at his coming to be the Christ, 
to be the anointed one. And then he goes on to be anointed by the Holy Spirit. And now today God has exalted him to reign over God's kingdom as Lord at his right hand. But how did that happen? How did Jesus come to reign over God's kingdom and be head of the church? Well, it wasn't the way other kings go about doing that. It wasn't through conquering all of his enemies and slaughtering them and eliminating all of his rivals to the throne. If you've been part of our summer series on King David, you've read some of what that kind of kingdom can look like. But Jesus' path to the throne as the anointed one was through emptying himself. It was through taking on the form of a servant and selflessly giving himself to humanity and even giving up his life on the cross. Jesus himself put it this way, and he said to them, this is from Luke 22, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. For who is the greater, one who reclines at table to eat, uh, or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table, but I am among you as the one who serves? We often look on human leaders and human rulers, and we ask if, especially when their time is over, we ask if they have been good leaders or bad. And usually, if we're really being honest and if we're really being thorough, uh, the answer has to be at least somewhat mixed, even when we're talking about the best of them. And that's because they're all fallen, they all struggle with sin, they're all imperfect. But Jesus' pathway to the throne through service, teaching, compassion, and sacrifice means that he is the leader, he is the Messiah who is entirely, perfectly good and who always has our best interests at heart and who loves us deeply. I know that talking about covenants and kingdoms and messiahs, I know that's a lot and I know it can also all sound a little detached, maybe a little removed from our daily 21st century lives. But if we look closer, and we tried to look a little closer this morning, Scripture presents these things as foundational to the Lord's church. And these things show us what God has already done and what God continues to do for his church. And that's something we need to appreciate before we even begin asking what we need to do to live faithfully as the church today. We need to appreciate what God has done first. So consider again with me the implications of these foundations for the church. Consider those again with me. God's covenant with us shows us that he genuinely wants a relationship with us. His kingship shows us that he is in complete control and his Messiah shows us how he rules not through force, not through threat, but through loving service and sacrifice. That's our God. That's Jesus. Whose scripture makes it clear Jesus is God. That's the one who is head over the church. That's the one we've given our lives to. And so as we take the Lord's Supper here in a moment, and as we go forward from here, and I hope you'll be part of the things planned after church, but as we go forward from here, go throughout our day and into the week, let's go forward with the knowledge, with the assurance, and with the encouragement that as the church, we serve a God who wants us. He doesn't just tolerate us. He's not eager to break off a relationship with us. He wants us. And let's move forward with the encouragement that the God who walks with us through our lives and through the life of this church is on the throne in full control with his final victory in no doubt. And that he loves us so much that he gave his Messiah who emptied himself out to us in service and sacrifice. That's someone we can submit to and follow. That's someone we can trust to forgive us our sins and give us eternal life. Amen. That's someone we can trust to take care of us and do what's best for us and grow us up and mature us knowing that we're growing in the right direction because he's the one doing it. That's someone we can give our entire lives to and find our lives even as we give it. And so this morning, like every Sunday, you were invited to come to him and, and, and know, enter into that covenant relationship uh, he, he can become your king. Uh, we can follow in the steps of the Messiah. We offer that invitation this morning. If you need to come forward and be baptized into Jesus' name, or if you need to ask, ask for prayers, uh, we encourage you to do that as we stand and as Jason leads us in our song of invitation. Come to
to Jesus, he will save you, though your sins as crimson glow. If you give your heart to Jesus, he will make it white as snow. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus. Come today, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come, come today, come to Jesus, do not tarry, enter in at mercy's gate, oh, delay not him. Supper will be number 299, I Stand Amazed, and if you don't mind, we'll sing all five verses first, and then we'll save the chorus for the very end. <clears throat> I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene, and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned sorrows he made them his very own he bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone when with the ransomed in glory his face I at last shall see twill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my song.
morning. It's time to partake of the Lord's Supper. You know, over the years, the controversy has been, how often should we take the Lord's Supper? And you know, it even happens even today. People are wondering, how often should we take it? Do you take it once a month at the first week of the month? Do you take it maybe every six months? Or let's make it real special on a special occasion. Let's do it on Easter. Or you know what? Maybe at a, we're getting married. Let's use the Lord's Supper there. Why can't we? Brethren, I like what Chris said a long time ago in a statement he made. If you want to know what God expects and what he wants, go to the source and you'll get your answer. You know, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, it says this. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, Lord's Supper, you proclaim what? You proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. There's two things there. You proclaim the Lord's death, and we know he rose on the third day, until he comes again. He will come again. Also, if you go to Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, it says, now on the first day of the week, there's your time frame, when the disciples came together, they came together as we are this morning and around the world. Why? To break bread, take the Lord's Supper. Let me ask you a question. Why is it it's so much of a controversy when you take the Lord's Supper? You know, in the Old Testament, God's people, they said, remember the, remember it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? You think they had trouble knowing what Sabbath day it was? <coughs> they knew the Sabbath day came every week. And brethren, that being the case, the first day of the week is in every week now. So we take the Lord's Supper on every first day of the week. And we will continue to do so until our Lord comes back again and receives us to himself. Bow me, please. Father in heaven, we're ever so thankful for this Loaf which so fitting represents Christ's body on the cross. The suffering, the scourging, the nails. Father, everything. He went to that cruel cross for each and every one of us that we may yet live. In his name, amen. Bow with me, please. Father in heaven, we're ever so thankful for this fruit of the vine, which so fitting represents Christ's shed blood upon the cross. He paid a price that we may yet live. He paid the ransom for each and every one of us. And be with us now as we partake, that we remember back for what our Lord has done. In his name. Now, separate apart from the Lord's Supper is the giving of our means. How much have you been blessed? You've been blessed, and as I have, without number. God has blessed us so much. And now, let us say, God, I'm going to give back a portion back to you, which is right for yours anyway. But I want to do what's right. Help me, please. Father in heaven, we have been so blessed. And we're ever so thankful for it. And there may be a time we take things for granted, and we pray that you'll forgive us for that. But take this back, Father, and we know that we are to give to show that we love the Almighty God. Watch over and care for us in his name. Amen. There's a collection plate here and also in the back. Thank you so much.
I want to say thank you to everyone who led us in our worship today. Thank you all of you for being here to worship God uh, together. I've got a handful of announcements I'd like to make, uh, and then uh, Chris also will have an announcement, and we'll have that special prayer that Jason uh, mentioned. Uh, one, we will have our Bible study tonight at 5 o'clock, so I encourage you to, to be here if you're able. Also, if you're visiting this morning, let me just reiterate what Jason said. If you would, please fill out a connection card. And we'd be very grateful for that, and we're really glad that you're here with us. Uh, our summer series <clears throat> it is out of date, but our summer series will continue this coming Wednesday with Mark Ashurst speaking about David's final days. So I'm sorry I've got the date uh, it's obsolete, but it will be this Wednesday at 7 o'clock with Mark Ashurst speaking. Uh, also, we are continuing to collect Bibles for South Africa to spread God's word uh, there. And so there's a, a box in the back. There's a sign with the translations that they're asking for. Uh, please give to that. That will uh, do a lot of good, I know. Also coming up on September 3rd, uh, we will be serving food at the homeless shelter at 6 o'clock. Uh, so I encourage you to be there for that. Or if you can't be there, you're welcome to still make food for, uh, for that act of service. Uh, I believe there's a sign-up sheet now on the back uh, in the lobby. Uh, I was told by the homeless shelter that they anticipate having approximately 23 people there that day that we would need to feed. On average, that's about how many to expect. So we, we need to feed 23 people. If you're able to, to be a part of that, uh, please sign up. Or if you have any questions, you're welcome to see me uh, about that. Also, we're continuing to collect uh, things for Brookside Elementary. There's also a, uh, no, there's not a sign-up sheet, but there has been a post, uh, and there, there should be something, uh, I know it was in the bulletin last week, uh, of the things that they need, and right out by that sign-up sheet is where you can uh, donate those things. Uh, also, I'm excited to announce, uh, related to House to House, Heart to Heart, something we're doing now is called the New Movers Program, where we get notified when new people move into the Nicholasville area, and that gives us an opportunity as they move in to uh, meet them even in person and say, welcome, we're glad you're in the neighborhood, you're welcome to come visit us. Uh, the truth is, a lot of people move into this area every month, like one or 200 or more. Uh, so it's a lot of people who move in and we need volunteers to help contact these folks. Uh, Barbara is, and Leslie have been spearheading this, Barbara especially, uh, and, and so I encourage you to see her. Uh, if you can help with that, we'd really appreciate that. Uh, again, after worship will be our Lads to Leaders kickoff and the Back to School Bash uh, downstairs. Uh, Chris, I'll go ahead and invite you to come up to make an announcement about that. As he's on his way up, are there any other announcements I've neglected that need to be made? April. The latest Bible study Saturday was Pastor Garrett's uh, speaking. Is that this Saturday? It is this Saturday. Okay, it is this coming Saturday with Chastity uh, speaking. Thank you. Ernie. For the visitors that we had this morning, would they please meet us at the line downstairs? Oh, yes. So if you're visiting this morning, you're welcome to stay for the potluck, and uh, we'll make sure that you are first in line for that. Thank you, Bernie. Dale. If there's someone that may need the elevator. Oh, yes. Thank you for that reminder. Uh, I know it can be difficult to get down the stairs, but we have a lift. Uh, if you're not able to get down those stairs easily, we have a lift in the, in the back stairwell. I encourage you to take advantage of that so you can be part of the day. All right, if there's nothing else, uh, Chris. <coughs> I just wanted to highlight the importance of what our children, your children, our children, mean to each other, mean to us. And as we come together as families, that we are one family. The importance of the Last Leaders Program and this Back to School Bash potluck. Methods in terms of instruction. I wanted to just highlight, although there is a convention in April, generally on the uh, Easter in Louisville for us, the most important thing is a year-round program. That is the dedication and the discipline that it takes that we want to encourage. And there may be some more discussion downstairs talking about how we can get more kids involved and more adults involved. So as Bob comes forward too, as we are about to lead this prayer, over our students beginning their term of instructions educationally as a back-to-school batch, I want to also highlight the importance of last leaders and just that interconnectivity. I'll end by saying that Proverbs 1, 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fools despise wisdom and instruction. Let me add that instruction is the beginning of the fear of the Lord because we instruct those that are behind us, both younger Christians and our younger kids, what it means to 
fear God and do his commandments. So Bob, if you would come forward and if families and, and students would come forward as well, we'll leave this prayer for our students. They'll listen to you, Bob. They won't listen to me. <laughs> Will you bow with me? Unto you, our Creator our Lord and our God. We bow this day, Father, coming together as one voice, one family. Father, asking your blessing upon our children, our students. Father, we offer encouragement as their instructors, as their guiders, Father, as their parents, as each and every member of this congregation has some part to play in learning and teaching our youngers. Be with each and every family, Father, during this, this year of instruction that will come. In the school systems, Father, whether they are in public schools, <coughs> private schools, or at home, bless their instructors, Father. Bless the hands that teach them. Bless the hearts that guide them. Father, bless the minds that show them knowledge and instruction. Bless each and every one of the children here, Father, each and every one of these students, Father. Give them encouragement from us. Let us focus that excitement, Father, that energy they have to be better dedicated and disciplined for you. Father, I ask this continued blessing on each and every family individual here. Father, I ask that you bless the words of my fellow elder, Bob Fry. Now we'll turn it to him. If I'm not mistaken, after this prayer, we're going to be dismissed. Is that right, Lee? Okay, great. You hear that, Nate? Okay, great. I misunderstood it. At this time, let us go to God in prayer on behalf of our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. Our Father God, we do thank you, dear God, for this wonderful and blessed day you've given us to enjoy. But we thank you most of all for these children, our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. And as sometime we take our children to the bus stops. We say goodbye to our children. And sometime, dear God, that we may not see our children again. But at this time, we want you to go with them and comfort them. Throw your protection around them in the, on the buses, in the school systems, no matter where they are, because we so dearly love our children, just like you love us. We thank you so much, dear God, for all of us as we gather here today to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we thank you so much, dear God, for the leadership of this congregation. And as we pray for the Lead to Leaders program at this congregation, we know that children stay in church more readily than they do without the church that they didn't was in involved with the Lead to Leaders program. And we're saying that we strive to keep our children in a Christ-like manner and we strive to be the examples that we want them to be, that they may grow up to be elders and deacons and teachers. And these young ladies may grow up to be great wives of these elders, teachers, and deacons. Go with us now as we continue to go with the rest of the services and the rest of this afternoon. Go with us and stand by us. But we thank you, dear God, for your darling son that hung, bled that out on that old cruel cross of Calvary, that one may he may say, good and well done, thou faithful servant, enter into thy kingdom. Forgive us for our many sins. We ask thee blessings in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I'll stand for the final song. <clears throat> I know that my Redeemer lives in ever praise. Ah. Uh...
you please bow with me? Our most gracious and loving God, Lord, we often wonder what it will be like when we meet you. Will we stand before you? Will we drop to our knees as our feet give out? Or will we fall prostrate before you in awe of your mercy and grace? Lord, you are the great I am. You are the king. You are the sovereign God above all things. A God so holy that even the wind and waves obey you. Lord, we thank you for giving us another beautiful day and another opportunity to worship you together. We have so much to be thankful for, and our words cannot express our gratitude. Above all, Lord, we want to thank you for sending your Son, the Christ, to die in our place for the forgiveness of sin. Lord, as we sit in comfort in our small town, we recognize the pain and suffering on a large scale in our world. We pray for strength for those who are in captivity, peace for those who are at war, and comfort for families of those who have not come home. This morning, our prayers are also for those in Hawaii who have lost loved ones, homes, and pets. We also pray for the wildland fire teams who risk their lives to contain and extinguish the fires. Lord, we pray for our children and teachers going back to school. Give them patience and peace of mind as they settle into new routines. As we depart the congregation today, we ask that you will equip us with strength and boldness as we enter the mission field. We pray for those around us that they that their hearts will be open to hearing the gospel and receiving Christ into their lives. We pray for our visitors, that they feel the warmth of your love in our community, and we pray for safe passage for those who are traveling. Lord, as we are about to uh, eat abundance of, of, of meals here, we ask that you will uh, bless the food that is used to nourish our bodies in your service. Bless the hands that prepared it. In Jesus' name we pray.